I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And we are the hosts of Geek Nights. It is a podcast. It's online. You can use Google to find this thing. But if you enjoy anything that happens in the next hour while we talk about Atari game design, then I encourage you to type that word into Google and you'll find all our biz, including a lot of videos of other panels we've done at PAX's for the last decade plus. But we're here today to talk about Atari game design. Now, what do we mean by that? Or more importantly, why Atari? Now, on one hand, the Atari was not the first console to make it into houses. There was Pong. There were other things before that. But Atari was one of the biggest in those early days. It was, it was almost the first really big one, at least, you know, in the United States, right? Arguably, it might have been the minimum viable console to reach a mass market. There were so many Ataris out there. It became the first console that a lot of people had and a lot of people were using. And you could count on friends having them. There was a user base. You could sell games for it. But minimum means minimum. So the Atari was an extremely limited console. And if you're younger than us, you might not quite understand how limiting the Atari was compared to even an old Nintendo. So, uh, you know, it came out at a time where, you know, a personal computer, right. You could buy was very, very expensive. Right. And sure enough would be more powerful than the Atari 2600, but the price made it prohibitive for like anyone. Right. Uh, the Atari 2600 was, you know, the best electronics you could get at a time for a price that you know someone might be able to buy as like a kid's toy only that didn't that didn't have any other use like a computer would have. Yep, cuz while there were productivity like learn basic programs on the Atari 2600, they were not they were not things you would actually want to use. But to really drive this home, uh, I'm not encouraging that you pirate software. The screenshot is just to illustrate a point. This is every Atari 2600 game. Every single one, including a bunch of things that were never released. And uh, I want you to look at those file ne- those uh, those file sizes because that's a K, not an M. That is five kilobyte. 582 kilobytes is every si- the, all the entirety of every Atari game, starting with numbers through the letter E that was ever made in human history. I could fit. You could you could take an MP a single MP3. All right, or maybe a couple of them, or maybe like a few photos, maybe even just one photo from your high resolution digital camera. And that would take up as much storage space as every Atari game, Atari 2600 game ever made and released. Ever. I was I was about to say I could fit these on two floppy disks, maybe three, but that also dates us quite a bit. <laughs> yep. So why are we talking about this? Really, a lot of you are here at PAX because you play games. Some of you want to make games. Many of you probably have very strong opinions about games. But a thing about game design that's pretty universal is that generally, when you're put under limitations, when there are constraints on what you can do in a game or what you can do making a game, that's where creativity tends to flourish. I mean, you know, it's not a... a, a, a like a set rule for the entire universe. But in general, you know, when you give most people like a task, right, to create something, right, you know, and it can, and if you just say, it can be whatever, right, no rules, do whatever you want, just a big white sheet of paper. They'll People stare at a white sheet of paper and they don't know what the heck to do with it, right? Yeah. Hey, Scott, right. tell me a story about anything. Uh... Tell me a story about a bear with a knife. Okay. So, right, <laughs> you just... You know, it's like, you ever see, if I gave you a white piece of paper and I just pre-drew just like a few lines on it, just, I, you know, there were some start lines there just pre-existing and you're going to doodle something. Well, your your mind is going to like add on to those lines the same way that like when you look at clouds in the sky, your mind says, oh, that's a turtle. Oh, that's a cloud, I guess. Right? <laughs> that's a lumpy space princess, whatever. Right. So much in that same way, if you're making games... If you just start with some lines already drawn, it has to fit in the small space of the Atari 2600. You only have this many colors to work with. You only have this frame rate to work with. You only have this controller to work with. 
right? That really can help get your mind going and help your design process go a lot faster and also push you into areas you would might not have gone given the blank white sheet of paper. Yep. Now, of course, there are giant AAA games that take five plus years to make and an army of developers, and, and those are great games. We're not saying that every limitation is necessary in all cases, and many a limitations actually yeah, hinder creativity in some ways. Yeah, and a lot of those... AAA games didn't start with a white sheet of paper. I mean, they don't have technolo the technological limitations the Atari 2600 games had, but a lot of them were just like, all right, we're going to make an FPS. Like, the, the, that's, yeah. their, that's their pre-drawn line, right, is what they've decided before they're, they get going. Yep. But uh, that's really, this is one of the things we want you to think about while we play some of these Atari games. Don't worry, we're going to play a bunch of Atari games later on in this panel. But think about limitations. Think about distilling games down to their essence. This is one of the most important skills you can have as a player, as a designer, as a critic. Anything in the game world is understanding what a game is at its core. Mm-hmm. So, can you take some cowboys, uh, problematic themes around what cowboys were really like aside, but some cowboys are going to shoot each other, and that amazing box art, I cannot stress enough how good the box art was on old Atari games. Like, if you want an aesthetic that speaks to me personally, it is that aesthetic. But Well, I think the Atari games, because the games themselves were so limited, right, I think that they intentionally you know, uh, put a lot of effort into the box art, not just as a way to sell the game, right? Because it might be hard to sell it if people saw the actual screenshots, right? In high, <laughs> <on> the <laughs> front of the, they were on the back of the box. So then on the front of the box, they might not impress, right? But also to stoke the imagination of the player, right? You know, it's like if you play Super Breakout and you've only ever seen the game itself, it's, it's you know... But if you play Super Breakout and you're, like, thinking about that amazing box art with the with the space people right the astronauts on it it's like damn right it, it can maybe you know it adds to the game even though it's not part of you know the actual software but it also forces you especially as a designer to really think about what is this game about what is the actual core gameplay core mechanic core feeling you want the players to experience what is the the bare minimum, the thing that you're trying to do. And you can start there and build up from that. Or in the case of the Atari, start there. And that's about as far as you can get. But the fact that it forces you to interrogate that. A lot of games have trouble where they try to do too many things at once. They try to have too many cool mechanics. You've all played a game that has a bunch of mechanics. And even like role-playing games, look at old advanced Dungeons and Dragons. How many rules were in that book that nobody read, that nobody touched, nobody dealt with those weird systems. So war, why were they even there? What were they doing? Uh, are they just confusing the game? If you can distill a game down, because what I've got on the screen, that's not the entire sprite sheet for Outlaw, but that is 90% of the sprite sheet for Outlaw. <laughs> you sprite used very loosely. Yeah. I mean, the Atari, I want to say five sprites could be moving on screen in an Atari. I don't know the exact number. <laughs> so distilling a game to its essence is also useful, uh, was more useful back when arcades existed, but... A thing that was happening in the Atari world that was very interesting is that previously, most people had only ever experienced video games in arcades. These were mm -hmm. buildings people would go to to play <laughs> consoles that were bespoke. There would be a whole console in a giant cabinet, like the size of a refrigerator, and that console played one game, and people would pay money to play that game. You have to understand that we are very old. <laughs> but when the Atari came out, one of the big selling points was, hey, you could have those games at home. But as we just talked about, the Atari 2600 could not do the things that those arcade machines could do. In fact, consoles couldn't really do what arcade machines did until well after the N64 era at best. It, well, you know, all the arcade machines themselves are also advancing, right? But... You know, you could have an authentic Pac-Man, right, on your home, you know, device as soon as you had, like, I don't know, maybe a 486 computer, I want to mm. say, right? Like a Windows 95 kind of, you know, situation. But the Atari was a decade before that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. so there was a lot. The Atari world had a really unique and interesting problem of trying to take a game that was very popular 
in arcades that millions of people had played. They already liked this game and they wanted to play it at home. Can you distill that game down to fit on a very weak console and yet maintain that core that the people actually liked and not anger them by giving them something that is different and not as fun and not as good? Can you do it? With Pac-Man... No, Ackman was too much. I, you know, I mean, at least you know it's. I guess it might have been possible, right? You know, you. But what they did make was not good enough. Yep. Um, and, and it comes it down Pac-Man to for Atari twenty six hundred. You know, it it had some of the aspects. Of, it looks like a Pac Man, right? Look, there's a little Pac Man there. There's ghost. There's a ghost. There's pellets. Yeah. There's two power pellets. Like it has all the same verbs and nouns as the original real Pac Man. But uh, arguably, and when we play it, you'll see if you're too young to have ever experienced this Atari Pac-Man, the MVP, the minimum viable Pac-Man, probably was the one that was in the arcade. Having multiple ghosts, having like the map be that size, those actually were critical to making Pac-Man fun. So having ghost pellet and power pellet and maze without enough ghosts, enough power pellets, enough etc., enough interesting behavior was not enough. That game was unplayable garbage. And we're going to play it today, and uh, you'll see. I do remember hearing that someone made a better Atari 2600 Pac-Man at some point, but I have to, I'd have to Google it to find out. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing we're not going to get into in this talk, at least, is the programming aspects of the Atari 2600. But I do want to make a point here. This is an interesting space because programming is both an engineering discipline, but also it's a creative discipline. And the challenges of making a game on the Atari are fascinating and interesting challenges. You could have a lot of fun trying to make an actual game that would run on an actual Atari 2600. But those are not the kinds of challenges we want to talk about today. We're really focused more on the game design aspects. What could the Atari do on the screen? And what, could, and what kinds of games can you make within those limitations? Yeah, the rules of the game, right? The, you know, the inputs of the game, all these sorts of things, right? Not the, you know, how they made it work, technologically speaking. Even though I have a computer science degree, <laughs> I've never programmed anything for an Atari. Um, just because why would I? I, yep. I don't have time for that. <laughs> but uh, to distill that conversation down, ideas without execution are nothing. We all, I have, we all, every one of you in this room, or this virtual room, you're, you're at a PAX. You probably have a lot of cool ideas for games. And someone else at some point probably made your idea. Because it turns out having a good idea for a game is worth basically nothing. I can tell you about my for anything is basically nothing. (laughs) Yep. We've all got great ideas, but execution, the programming part to make that Atari game, that is incredibly valuable and important, important, but we're not focusing on that. This panel is about the opposite execution without ideas. I mean, I guess making a clone of Microsoft Excel, (laughs) like that type of programming That's not interesting. The interesting part of game design that we're going to talk about is the idea itself. What is the idea with the constraints of the Atari? And if you're interested in the execution side of Atari, well, I have good news for you. The internet has a huge number of resources. Uh, Go watch interviews with David Crane. Learn about how he made Pitfall work. Because sometimes execution begets ideas. Pitfall basically was made because David Crane, I'm paraphrasing a lot here, had come up with a way to make a little man run smoothly and jump and do stuff on an Atari. And then the question was, what kind of game could I make with this technology? And Pitfall, Pitfall, arguably the first platformer, one of the first games in this like mega genre, Pitfall appeared from that technological advancement, the ability to make a little dude on a screen run left and right and jump a little bit and put some stuff on the screen and make it all work. Uh, And there's a documentary called, uh, what, Racing the Beam? That gets into fantastic detail on the ridiculously clever crap that Atari programmers had to do. Things like programming game logic 
into the like cycle of writing images to the screen while those images were not visible, like before you get to the point where it would appear on the screen, putting game logic there. You ever play an old Atari game and you see like the screen goes crazy with a bunch of flashing colors? A lot of times that's because the game is using all, all of the Atari's processing power to calculate something, to figure out the next chess move or generate a map or something. And all that noise on the screen is basically just visual artifacts of the actual logic that is making that thing happen. It is ridiculous nonsense that one, is way out of scope for this panel. Two, other people way smarter than us who know a lot more about this than us have covered this to a depth that we never would. And three, we only have an hour with you today. So let's play some Atari games. I think if we actually play some of these games and talk about the game design, what's work, what works, what doesn't, what's good, what's bad, etc. Playing games is the best way to understand games as long as you play games and think about them. Think about what you enjoy. It's a theme we talk about a lot in our panels. Don't just play games because they're fun. Understand what you find fun about them, even if you never want to make a game. Everything we're talking about in this panel in this panel applies to you because if you understand what exactly you find fun about games, you will have a lot more fun with games. So while you're playing an Atari game, and this is sort of the framework we're going to use as we play each one of these games to understand it, to interrogate it, uh, think about these things when you're playing a game. What are the main mechanics? What can I do as a player? What is the game doing? These are Atari games. There's a finite number of them. We'll be able to discover them pretty quickly just by clicking buttons. Did you know the Atari has one button? We've got one button and a joystick. That's what we got to work with. And a couple oh, of... You got player, yeah, player two has a button. And yep. then the, switch, the switches on the Atari as <laughs> there, well. There are two switches. Physical switches. You can go up to the Atari and flick. Some games, like that terrible Ghostbusters game, you got to like run over to the Atari and flick the switch at the right moment to do things. <gasps> yeah. Open the trap. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, no, it's uh, you only do it to catch the Marshmallow Man on okay. the Atari remake. Uh, but then... For this finite number of mechanics, what would it take to make this mechanic better? Because even if you have a very distilled game, you might very rightly think, I could make this mechanic more fun, more interesting, more engaging. But think about what would that take? What, would, what is the full extent of what you would have to add to make this mechanic better? And then compare that with a very important question. Does that mechanic need to be better? Just because you can make something better doesn't mean it will make your game better. You've got to think about not only what will it take, but do I need this? Does this expand my game too much? Usually you'll do better by simplifying rather than adding complexity. And then last, at all moments... Especially yeah, when you have to remove right? <laughs> add complexity. Yeah. On the Atari, adding anything will come at a terrifying cost. But last... Even when your game is so distilled, even if you've designed the perfect board game, you think everything is perfect, this game is perfect, you're going to ship it, you should still ask yourself, could I remove something without compromising the core of this game? This game is about X, could I remove something, and the game is still satisfyingly about X? The answers to these questions are difficult. Asking these questions, especially if you made a game, can be terrifying. It's very hard to look at something that you made and you love and force yourself to think, could I remove something that I spent tears and blood and hours on? The answer is usually yes. And the more you're able to identify those things and say yes to removing things, generally the better you might do. So Berserk was a pretty popular arcade game. Uh, I know there are a lot of ports of it, but this is the Atari 2600 port. One thing you got to know about these Atari games is it has a million, million modes. And the only way to know what each one of these modes is, is to look in the manual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these, I mean, you know, considering that the games definitely couldn't have tutorials or anything of that sort, you know, even on the NES and SNES for that matter, right? It was expected that if you're playing a game, you had the manual and you read it beforehand. Uh, because if you don't, the games become sort of incomprehensible. And as a result, to give you, the, the viewer, you know, a good assessment of what these games, you know, have going on, we sort of need to explain to you some of the information from the manual. 
right? yep. or at least some backstory. But I remember as a kid, like whenever we got a new Atari game or a new NES game, even SNES, first thing you did is you, me and my brother, we'd fight over who got to read the manual. Well, because you'd be in the you you would you wouldn't be downloading anything or having something shipped to your house. You the download to was toys. being stuck in the car trying to get home from Toys R Us. Right. You went to a toy store and bought the game. You open it in the car and start reading it. That's what you know on the ride home, and then you get home and then you play. So anyway, so Berserk, you know, followed much later, uh, a few years later, by Robotron, right? A very similar game is, you know, a game where you're a guy in a room and there's bad guys, robots in the room. And you're trying to kill them all and not get killed. Yep. And, and you you beat the level by killing all the robots, and then you go to the next room. And this uh, is an Atari game and an arcade game, so there's no winning. Like, nothing we're talking about has a winning condition. You just play it, get a high score. And I only get score if I kill the robots. Now, the arcade version, you played with a joystick and a button to shoot, which is pretty much exactly what the Atari 2600 version had. Robotron improved on this formula a thousand fold by having you play with two joysticks, one controlling your, you know, movement and one. And ah, I got them both one, to walk into the wall. Yeah. The other one controlling your shooting. So that way you could, for example, move right and shoot left. You cannot do that in Berserk. If you, nope. you can only move and Ooh. shoot in the one, in the one direction at a time. So look at this. There, this game is so simple. Look, there's robots. There's my little dude. And there's electric walls, and there's pretty much nothing else. But already, look at all this behavior we can get from these simple mechanics. So one, the robots clearly get faster and more powerful, like they didn't shoot before. They can shoot each other. Maybe I can trick them into shooting each other. I can definitely trick them into walking into the walls. And uh, if things look dicey, I can just bail. Yep. Uh, so oh no, if I bail, they get harder. Yeah. So in a way, this is actually taking advantage of the weakness of the. Oh, <laughs> you got, Dang it! Uh, oh shit! Of the, ah, God damn it! Yeah. So that's a, that's a problem that one. But so it's taking advantage of the weakness is that they don't have the processing power to make good robot AI, right? There's no way they can make smart robots that like I literally just lost. Good job. Uh, that you know somewhat intelligently hunt you down in a in a in a fun and clever way, right? Um, but the robots being unintelligent actually is a is a positive aspect of the gameplay, right? In that you can, you know, their simple rules that they follow, A, makes it sort of possible to even play this game in the first place, right? Because if the robots were smart, you would just be dead. Um, but also, you know, you can have fun in that you don't have to shoot them all. You can trick them into shooting each other or going into the wall, right? Uh, Granted, it's easy for you me to bump into the wall. Yeah, sometimes you don't have to trick them. They just do it on their own. <laughs> What's going on with your smiley face there? So this game has a lot of modes. And one of the modes, there's one more element that can appear. If you stay in a level too long, this bouncing smiley face appears and eventually kills you. Mm. It's Depending on the mode, it is invulnerable. And that is a, basically a way to increase challenge. Uh, if I keep going through the game, the robots will get slightly smarter, slightly more aggressive. I, well, they don't actually get smarter. They just get more aggressive. Like, see how they just slowly start walking toward me? That other one, they'll eventually keep converging on my position. They're not smarter about that as the game goes on. They just get faster at doing it, and they shoot faster. So if I just keep going through the game, they're just going to get faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. But it's an Atari. There's an upper limit to how fast they can be. So these other modes will do things like introduce that smiley face to put me under even more pressure and make the game even more difficult. Because the only I, yeah, way... I think without, this, without the smiley face, the game could even become so trivially simple. Um, in that, yeah. Ooh, the, ooh, ooh. <laughs> that was a close one. It's like without the smiley face, if you just take your sweet time, it's like, are you really going to die if you're really careful and you really concentrate? I, you know, it's like, I don't think so. Which is a you need common that... failing of a lot of these early arcade games is the game will literally never get more difficult after a certain point. And then the game is just how long are you willing to sit here? So, so we go way back with Dig Dug. Dig Dug is one of my favorite arcade games. I would play it in the arcade contemporary to when it was in actual arcades, putting real quarters into it. Yep. Now, I'll admit, until this panel... I had never played the Atari 2600 Dig Dug because... Oh, I had. I, I played it briefly. Because I had 
the uh, Atari 7800 at home, which had a much better implementation of Dig Dug. The Atari 7800 was actually comparable to the original Nintendo Entertainment System in terms of its power until the, the memory management chips and some advanced things appeared in the NES. It was comparable to the 7800. But anyway, this, remember we talked about Pac-Man, this is a demake of a very popular, moderately complex game. And we're going to see if Dig Dug on the Atari actually is able to capture the essence of Dig Dug on the arcade. The fact that they've so got clearly, that... Gra- so Right, so clearly graphically, it's nowhere near Dig Dug Arcade. The resolution is clearly lower. Yep. Um, but they've managed to get most of the colors right. It's, you know, Puka is red-ish. You know, the dirt has the different la- layers of color. Uh, the Figar is green. Oh, uh, and that Dig music... Dug is- Listen to that. That sounds like the actual arcade sound. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's not identical, but it's, you know, it's clearly the same song. Um, you know, the mechanics seem to be the same, right? You know. Oh, I can even do the little, like, double kite. Yeah, he can pop the guys. Right? All right, it's let's like drop mechanic. one of these boulders. Well, the fruit appear. Yeah. I, I saw the fruit. I know the fruit's going to appear. Come on, come on. Let me give me the fruit. Ah. Nope. You should have dropped the boulders before killing the guys if you wanted the fruit. Let's I see. Should've. Let's see if the rules of Dig Dug are the same on the twenty six hundred as they are. If they are, okay. then oh crap! The bad guys do seem to be a little bit more aggressive and faster. Um, yeah, they're, the the, the bad guys are coming at me faster than what I'm used to. Yeah, in the arcade that you have a little time, at least, especially in level one or two. Uh, that was my fault. That was that was I just <laughs> failed at that. Um, Actually, yeah, this looks- is. While this looks pretty bad, I gotta say, this feels a lot like real Dig Dug. Like, this actually feels right. All right, so the bad guy didn't get... I mean, he died when the rock fell on him, but he... Oh, the fruit appeared? Yeah, the fruit was just a green shape of some kind. It didn't, like, look like a fruit, but... This is a... In terms of the gameplay, this feels... 90% 90% like real Dig Dug. It looks weird. I think the mo- well, yeah, I think the most impressive thing really is just the frame rate, right? It's like, yeah. you can see it's not lagging or slowing down or anything. Like, it's moving. You know, the bad guys are moving quickly. Yep. When I'm Dig horizontal, so look at this. When I'm directly horizontal with an enemy and I'm moving toward them, they'll blank out. Depending on what else is in that same row. So the- every now and then there's invisible monsters. The bad guy intelligently moved away from the falling rock, just like real Dig Dug. Actually, other than being uh, slightly more aggressive, the bad guy logic feels very close to the original Dig Dug too. It's close. I think there are some there are some minor things that I haven't seen. Like, can you pump the through through a tiny wall? Yes. Oh yes, you can pump through a tiny wall. Can the can the I assume the Figar can breathe through a tiny a tiny wall? Uh, I don't know if I can engineer that experience. Yeah. Um. Uh, the flowers, for when you showing you what your current level is, are not appearing on the top. So yep. that's, that's missing. But it's interesting um, because the things that are missing, like the flowers that would show up at the top there, are not core to the game. They are things that could have been removed. They were just nice to have. Yeah, that was just the thing that would indicate. Well, all the flowers did was tell you what level you were in, right? Yep. So you didn't, it's not, you can still play Dig Dug without those. You just won't know what level you're in, right? Um, you'll just know your score and that's it. And you're live. Yep, the visual artifacting isn't even getting in my way that much. Uh, I would say this is a minimum viable Dig Dug. Dig Dug on the Atari 2600 is pretty much as fun and is doing the same thing for me as the actual Dig Dug. Now, of course, I would prefer the actual Dig Dug because it looks better. (laughs) I mean, the actual Dig Dug does have advantages over this, but it's like this is not something you're going to like be upset about and be like... You know, oh, this isn't Dig Dug. This is just something that looks like Dig Dug. You know, tr- you you took my money. If you bought this on an Atari 2600 cartridge and you were a Dig Dug fan, you are not complaining. I am earnestly you impressed this, by this. You can play this in your house in 1980, well, whatever. Right? I would say, oh, honestly. They even, had two pu- they even had two pukas on top of each other. And look, right? remember that thing we said on Berserk when a game might... Like, a lot of dangers of these old games are very simple games that they never get harder. This game is getting harder. I'm, I'm sweating here, just like I would in real Dig Dug about this point. Yeah, in real Dig Dug, you know, it's like they start adding more bad guys. Look, they added, managed to add all these Figars, and the frame rate is not going down. Right? It's still it's still going at a pretty good clip. The uh, Some of the bad guys are blinking, you know, but yeah, it's, it's, 
uh, look, they got a Puka and a Fygar on top of each other. I think it might hit a limit. Um, yep. I feel like this. Point. there will be a point where this will not get harder enough, but uh, so far this is feeling pretty good. All right, so Pitfall. I'll just hit start. So Pitfall is, like go, we go, said. First of all, you're going left or right. Uh, so as a kid, I always wanted to go left because left. when you die, check this out. Oh, no, I died. Ah, now I've skipped the thing that killed me. <laughs> <laughs> so clever you are. Oh, look, the logs are rolling away from me. Yep, it's pretty much... I, I forget what the optimal... Oh, I missed it. The optimal way to go is, but uh, if you're going for the perfect score. But as a kid, I always went left. I don't trust that empty space, and I was right not to trust it. Yep. So yeah, Pitfall is a game where you walk left or right. You know, you can pick either way. So that's actually somewhat interesting in that, uh, you know, you can get some variations on gameplay to reduce, you know, because it's the same thing every time. It's not random, right? Yeah. It's literally a hard-coded sequence of screens, uh, but it loops around. So that actually gives you two different ways to play. You know, if you're good enough to guess loop around the whole thing, then that doesn't matter so much, but most people aren't. And so you actually sort of can go left or right and get some more interesting, you know, you get more replay value out of that. You know, you won't have to go to the same screens every single time. You just go to the same screens at the time. Yep. Um, they also give you the downstairs, right? The enticing downstairs area. So that you, it's like you can go through on the upper level, but if you find a ladder, you can go through on the lower level. And that also gives you more varied gameplay. It's like, oh, well, I can just, you know, go down. You want to go down? Yep, so in here, there, right? let's see, there's I guess this. you're going to, there's a brick wall, yeah. Yeah, there's two, um, all, there are brick walls and things in the way. You might go down the tunnel for a while and then bump into the brick wall. Let me get somewhere I can go down that'll be interesting. But it does give you some more variations on, you know, where where you can go. There we go. what you can do for more excitement. All right, yeah, we'll go down. Oh, yeah, down here. Yeah. So you got to worry about scorpions down here instead of uh, logs, you know, and holes and that sort of thing. But scorpions are kind of nasty, so... Yep, because they're moving. It's kind of easy to get hit by them if you're not paying attention. It's literally pick your poison. I don't yeah, remember it, the map, but uh, a big part of this game is the map is the same map every time, but as a kid, I was, like, charting out what's where. Oh, it was a dead end! Yep. Can't get through there. Well, all the way back. Yep. I, and I died. And now the problem of going left. God damn it. Yeah. God damn it. Oh, God damn it. I think I'm dead. <laughs> time to start over. Let's go right. Go right. Go right this time. So you can also see that going right or left, since the logs always spawn on the right side of the screen, right? Uh, uh, I'm having trouble with challenge. these logs. Yeah. Playing the left or right direction gives you a different challenge entirely, right? In terms of, you know, if you're going, if you're playing a going, a going left run, you're right, you're just, you can just keep running left and you get behind the logs. Oops. Uh, I'm bad at this. <laughs> yeah. I was never good at this game. <laughs> I think you can... Oh, I messed it up. You I think can you can stand, stand on the, right on their eyes. You can stand on the eyeball of the alligator and won't. Yeah, you won't fall in to his mouth. Granted, the pro move is to get across in one go because that countdown is ticking. You only got 20 minutes. And I'm so bad at this, I haven't even gotten to any treasure to show you, but uh, the whole point yeah, of this game, <laughs> have the highest score after 20 minutes, and the only way to make your score go up, because look, bouncing off of logs, my score is going down. The only way to make it go up is to find treasure. Yep, everything else either kills you, right, or makes your score go down, right, if it doesn't kill you. So the logs don't kill you, they just make you lose points. Uh, did Falling you lose doesn't points? kill you, but you do lose points. Yeah. Uh, but alligators kill you. Falling in water or or any a hole that the can kill you. Scorpions obviously kill you. I'm not sure if you fall in that black hole. Will you go to the bottom? No, you'll just die. That's a tar pit. You'll just you'll just die as a tar pit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what's this? Core, the game, the core game loop is real simple. Explore the map, find treasure. And the fact that it's time limited is actually very interesting because the game becomes learn the map and the game also becomes optimize your path through the map. Learn how to get through these obstacles quickly. I can do it the slow, cautious way or I can do it the fast way. 
The game but gives you, you the slow if you do it the slow cautious way, even if you manage to never get hit by any log or any bad guy ever, you probably won't be going fast enough to get all the treasures in the whole map before time runs out. And talk about early uh, esports or early not speed runs necessarily. This game is not a speed run. It is possible to you get a speed perfect run. How, how many? How much? How long it takes to get all the treasure? Well, there is a perfect score you can get in this game of get every treasure in the whole map without at any point losing points or die. But you can, it, you can also see who can do that the fastest. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the world record is set and there's no way to make it better. Uh, I'm, maybe. Uh, I haven't I'm checked. Not, not a, I'm not an, yeah, I'm not an expert. So the other thing that's going on in Pitfall is, you know, the, the simple Atari can't do too much. So they've only made a few different things, right? They have Scorpion, Treasure, Dude, Hole, Alligator, Water, yep. Tar Pit, uh, Fire snake. and Snake are basically the same. They're just something you jump over. Fire and Snake are the same, right? So... But though, with those simple elements, by combining oh ladder, right? Yep, uh, these brick pits, wall. The brick wall. With just it's 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 not it's not that few elements, but with just a very small number of elements, each screen combines those elements in different ways, right? Oh, a treasure! That was a trap. There it is. Yep. Combines Ooh. those elements in different ways to keep things interesting, right? It's like yeah, look, we got a scorpion, some water that doesn't. Uh, go away and a log and a rope. Now we got water that does go away and a log. Got to time this right. Every screen can nice. be unique combining this palette of obstacles. Yep. And you know, you learn once you learn how to deal with one ob you know, like once you learn how to swing on the rope properly, Oops. it's like, okay. I just jumped I, right I into that I mouth. You did. <laughs> you know how to swing on the rope. Congrats. You know, you know, but now swing on a rope when there's a snake on the other end. Now swing on a rope when there's alligators underneath. Now swing on a rope when the hole opens and closes. Oh, if the hole closes with a good time, I could get off the rope quicker. And I won't fall, you know, because I'm not crossing anything dangerous. Oh, but if I get off the rope quicker here, there's an alligator. <clears throat> I don't want to get off quicker. Yep. Or eventually I, I learn the map and I learn that this is the part where you want to go underground because it's faster. Yep. Um... So yeah, it, you know, it manages to stay interesting uh, with very, very few pieces uh, to play with. And the controls, right? All you have is a joystick and a button, right? Yep, the so button, that's, that's, jump. That's it. That's all, you, that's all you need. You don't need anything else, right? Because anything you interact with is by jumping. You're either jumping over an obstacle and you, you grab the rope automatically. You, you do have to the... drop off the rope by hitting down. You choose when yes, you want to drop off. You press down to get off the rope and you can get off the rope at any time. Right. So think about just the ability to get off the rope at any time is in itself sort of an interesting mechanic. Like, you know, it's like, OK, you got one button. But you have a lot of options there. Right. You could possibly like drop off the rope and land on the alligator's eye if you needed to on a particular screen. Right. Yep. The timing is really good. Uh, you know, so the core gameplay loop, explore the map. Don't die. Find treasure. Like, it's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. There is an interesting and unique, pa like, a palette of all these different challenges. This game is extremely elegant and has, I think, maximized its core loop. Nice treasure. Nice treasure. Wasn't as good as the diamond yeah. ring. No, but even the treasures look different, right? And that's that could be exciting and more fun, too. It's like, you grab, oh, look at that, right? He was about to fall in the pit as it was opening, but he was able to grab the rope on the backswing, right? You know, you, you, there isn't just oh. one. Ra you know, there isn't just one way to swing on the rope. There isn't just one way to you know jump over a hole with that one jumping button and the rope. Right, so much variation and and different things can happen. So yeah, this game, I would hesitate to say that there's anything, any mechanic that needs to be better. This game fully realizes its core vision with a very minimal set. I guess you could remove either the snake or the campfire because they are in effect the exact same thing they're gameplay in effect wise. the exact same thing however it does add more interest and you know uh excitement you know visually right if every treasure was the same it would be a little bit more boring it's kind of exciting it's like you already yeah. got the money bag when if you find the diamond ring it's like ooh. oh yeah look at that right there how did you, did you know it was there did yeah. you know it was on the next screen because I did not. I literally didn't. <laughs> but it's like, ooh, right? It's it, it it's a little more fun to find different looking treasures than to find the same one yep. over and over again. Well, case in point two, look at the above here. Like those trees in the background, not strictly necessary. You could make this game more minimal. You could even make this game in black and white. But 
that's all polished. Just because you're distilling a game down to its essence doesn't mean you should remove everything that is pure style and doesn't do anything for the actual gameplay itself. Style, aesthetics, there's a reason video games look good. It's also really fun that when you swing on the rope, it goes do 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 do, which is which is reminiscent of like you know a Tarzan caricature going oh oh, oh right. Yep. That's definitely what they were mimicking with the sound and with the limited audio capabilities of the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, they managed to pull it off to where you recognize it for what it is, right? If you have the appropriate, you know, cultural references to go by. So yeah, you wouldn't think this game could get any better. Oh, Pitfall 2. So I have never played Pitfall 2 in my life. I didn't have it as a kid. Nope. So... Also worth noting that both of these Pitfalls were games that, uh, much like E.T., were made for the Atari. They weren't arcade ports, right? Yep. Uh, I don't know if I've seen an arcade Pitfall machine. There may be one, but this was definitely first made for Atari 2600. So notable one, it's playing this song. It is playing just music. That is interesting. That is not something the original Pitfall did. And two, uh, already I see multiple different enemies that are doing different behaviors. Mm -hmm. You can also see... Ooh, look at that. Oh, that didn't kill me. Look at this. Yeah, there's some there's some vertical action, right? Oh, shit. Look at that rat. Look at that rat. Go. Oh, it didn't it's kill pushing. me. It's just pushing me. Yep. Can I jump over it? Should it go... I can't get past can this you? rat. Can you? I don't know if I nope. can. I don't think you can. I wonder if I need something. There's only one button, so uh But yeah, they've the gradients, right, add a lot more visual interest uh, and contrast to a lot of the objects in the game, right? Especially in the sky. Uh and they're also reminiscent of the box art, right? Uh you know, and they also indicate motion, as is the case of that waterfall. I'm getting boy in his blob feelings. This is a large map. Look at this. Look at all the interesting places I've encountered is already. Is that an electric eel, right? Yep. Like, it's just a thing that blinks black and white, but you can just tell from that little abstract I wonder if it squiggle. kills me. Yep, okay. that's an electric, it's an electric eel. It hurts. Where does it send you? In so, your... it's going to take me back to the last checkpoint. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a checkpoint, is it? Yeah. What's that what's that wiggly thing with the legs? That looks like a dog or a hyena or something. I see that frog down there. Oh, it's a frog, but the thing that's wiggling, that could be like a hostage you need to rescue or it could I be don't know what that is. I'm sure the yeah. manual would tell me. I'm sure it would. Um but so, also you know you know, Atari game boxes in general featured a lot of gradients, but the Activision ones in particular all had this same graphical style with this sort of like stripey rainbow kind of shape mm. with colors that match the color scheme of the game. And you can also see here how they've put the rainbow behind the Activision at the bottom. That's very fancy looking, right? All right, so uh, basically... What's interesting here, like the, uh, something to take away, because you, you can probably do a whole left. panel just can playing you, this game. Can you go left? Nope, you cannot go left. Okay. Pitfall, the original Pitfall, as we just discussed, was kind of an MVP game. Like, it was good enough. It was distilled to its essence. It was designed well. Pitfall 2 did more, but it does not replace or obviate the success of Pitfall 1. Partly, it seems like more creative programming techniques opened up more possibilities on the Atari, which is a thing you can look at. Two, they added more mechanics that expanded on the core of the game without compromising on the game being fun. Atari, or Atari, ET added all these extra mechanics. I'm real bad at this. But those extra mechanics came at the expense of the core game loop. This game, all this extra stuff, did not come at the expense of the core game loop. They found clever technological ways to do more around that core game loop. Yeah, it's like, hey, we'll add more levels, right? It's three or four levels deep, right? They added the swimming, more animations. Uh, they added more enemies, more different treasures, right? It's just, it's, it's the same thing, right? It's not, they didn't mess it up. It's still that same pitfall game. Uh, it's all fun for the same reasons. You're doing the same things, but they just made it more exciting with more stuff going on. So you get bored 
you know, after a long, it takes longer to get bored. Yep. So, you know, when you played a, a Metroidvania like Symphony of the Night or Portrait of Ruin or, or even a Metroid game and all you thought was, you know what? That core loop, that gameplay, just give me more of that forever. Here we go. This is just Pitfall 2. Oh, you like Pitfall? Here's more Pitfall. We added more stuff. Yeah, too, too many games these days, I think, don't learn that lesson, right? It's like, I, you know, you made a game that's so good, you don't need to go and, like, make something new or different or change what you were about. People liked what you were. Just make more of what you were, right? Now, that's not to say we should never make anything new, um, but I think that there are a lot of cases where sometimes people are not making anything new at all, right? They carry on with the same boring thing forever. Uh, they're not expanding the way Pitfall 2 expanded on Pitfall 1 while staying the same. They're literally just releasing Pitfall 1, Pitfall 1, Pitfall 1. That's no good, right? But releasing Pitfall 1 and then coming out with Pitfall 2 that looks nothing like Pitfall 1, that's also not good, right? This is exactly what you want to do when you make a sequel or an expansion, right? Don't change what you are about, right? That core thing that you are, embrace whatever that is, just more of it, right? Yep. Um, what did you know, players don't, like don't about like, your don't game? Be like, yeah, game one, if game one is chocolate, chi chocolate chip cookie, right? Game two can't be oatmeal cookie, right? <laughs> it, could be it could be chocolate chip cookie with nuts. It could be bigger chocolate chip cookie. It could be bigger chocolate chip cookie with nuts. <laughs> but it shouldn't be... You know, plain old sugar cookie. Is right? this the first game that has be, checkpoints? I don't know, but it's definitely an older game that does have checkpoints. I presume if you die, you're going to go back to that checkpoint. I presume I am as well. Also, this map is looking bigger and bigger and bigger the deeper I go. Yep, look how deep it goes. Are you going to die from falling damage? I'm going to find out. No, I died of falling on a bat. <laughs> Oh, my points. I just got a bunch of points, and now they're gone. Look at that. Yep, checkpoint worked. You know what I appreciate, though? Notice Pitfall 1 had lives. Lives were something that a lot of games had, especially arcade games, because that's how you run out of lives. You got to continue. Pay a quarter. And you and you would buy lives with your, with your money. Yep. This game, no lives. I'm losing points, but I can just keep exploring the checkpoints... Just uh, the deeper I go, the more checkpoints. Even though I suck at this and I keep dying, who cares? I can just keep playing. I'm not well, forced to always start that's over. That's also how Gauntlet worked, right? In Gauntlet, yep. and we, you would have po life, which would be your points, right? And you yep. would put money in to get more life. And then when you got hit, you would lose life. And you're also constantly losing life. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So many of you have probably played Rampage, at least. Rampage has been released in various forms in a lot of places. But, uh... Play Rampage on the Atari 2600. This is another game where it's an arcade game, so anyone who would play this has a lot of expectations about what this game is. Yeah, you've already played the arcade version. You already understand, you know, the mechanics, right? So if you haven't played the arcade version, then a lot of what's going oh. on here, right, might not make too much sense. You know, you might not understand that, like, that blinking thing that was just a rectangle that you punched at the start, that was supposed to be, like, a sign. Yep. It says, like, eat it, eat it, Joe's, or whatever. And I hit it at the uh, wrong time, so it was electrified. So check this out. This is actually getting the core loops. I'm destroying this building, and look, I can attack the building across from me. I can hit yeah. forward. I can hit down. I can really all, mess all this. this. All the same attacks in the arcade are available at home. Yep. Um, visually, you you know, you're not seeing the things that are like partially damaged, right? It's literally just making rectangles go away. Um, but so far, all the elements of the arcade version are here in a diminished form. Uh, yeah. Yep. The controls, at least, uh, I I can't. Oh, there goes the building. Yeah. But uh. It feels pretty tight. It actually feels very responsive and satisfying. And I'm kind of having fun. Oh, let me jump up. Oh. It's doing everything I expect a Rampage game to do so far. Yeah, it's not as... There's not as much stuff on... It's, it's only level one. Um, but, the you know, the original Rampage did have more things happening oh, on the screen. I, mean, I think I can get those helicopters, which was a big part of Rampage. Yeah, take that. Now can I eat that dude? Yes. Yep, you can eat the dude to get uh, health back. That's good. Yeah, it's, it's like they went down the checklist of every single thing in the arcade rampage. They put them all in here, 
and just they're a lot simpler looking especially the graphics are vastly vastly inferior yeah, to I'll, the original arcade game it's but. definitely taking some imagination like we can tell these are buildings but there's not a lot going on in terms of what i'm destroying yeah all right so this is spider-man for the atari 2600 i had this game as a kid i played it a lot so i'll just start so i never was clear if those people are villains or not but check this out i'm old spider-man i can throw a web and i can swing around if you're making a spider-man game you better let me throw a web and swing around if i can't do that what the hell kind of game is it that is pretty great. Uh, so ooh, yeah, this ooh. is actually the very first uh, video game uh, to feature Spider-Man and also the first Marvel Comics video game. So there were a lot of Marvel games in the arcade. They all came after this one. This is literally the first Marvel game and the first Spider-Man game ever. Uh, it was actually made by Parker Brothers. It wasn't made by like Atari or, or you know, some other Activision or anyone like that, right? Um, so yeah, they were definitely treating it as like, you know, Parker Brothers who made board games, right? You know, they were definitely, you know, treating it as like a... a Oof! You know, a Ow, that's toy, a brutal fall. Right? They were approaching it from that angle and not from the video game angle. Uh, and also, they didn't have any game to model it on, right? Yeah. They, had to, they were just saying, all right, what does Spider-Man do, right? Well, he webs around, right? So that's so the core... Go web game. around and hit right. people. But basically, I also get points. Check out these bombs. They start black. They turn pink when they're about to blow up. And if I touch them, There's I can disarm them. That's clear. Look, that's very low res. That's clearly the Green Goblin up there. All right, let me go get that Green Goblin. Now, I don't think I can fight the Green Goblin. I think what I have to do is get to the top and disarm the bomb he's put on top of this building. Mm. I guess those little bombs are just to hurt me as Spider-Man. Yeah, th those are bombs the Green Goblin is throwing at you. Uh you know, I'm bad at this. Bombs. Oh, the Hobgoblin threw the pumpkin bombs and the, the Green Goblin. Yeah, threw Hobgoblin the pumpkin was pumpkin bombs. Oh, look, if I get a person. I don't even also... know if Hobgoblin, the character, existed in the comic books when this came out. Maybe they did. <laughs> <laughs> There's no timer in this game, but see that red thing? That's how much web juice I got. So I got to be economical with my web juice. Mm, that's accurate to the comics where Spider Man's web shooters were God, you know, so mechanical things that he made. Um, you know, but control wise, you no, know, it looks kind of great, especially for an Atari thing, like the way Spider-Man swings. Yep, like, it wow. feels good. It's difficult. Like this is hard, but it's not. All right, let's get past you. Oh God, nope. I'm so bad at this. Right, Green Goblin, screw you. Yes, I disarmed right. that. I assume is a bomb. Yeah, you know, Spider-Man's trying to touch the checkerboard thingy. And the game just escalates and... in difficulty from there. Yeah, this is one of those games where the goal is the core gameplay loop is very simple and very arcade-like. It is get better at the core gameplay loop. Yeah. I mean, even Donkey Kong, you had, you know, four different, a few different levels, right? It wasn't just the same, you know, Donkey Kong thing over and over, right? You go through four different things, at least. Um, oh, if it gets way harder later, look at that. Yeah, look, he's coming low. No. I'm going to have trouble getting past him. Timing. Go. Okay. Hey, you should have gone straight up. But no, this is a solid distillation. Like, I would encourage you to play this game to see how good these controls feel, considering how utterly limited they are. Yeah, and going with our theme of, you know, to make your game, you know, figure out the one fun thing. Like, this is literally it. This is, you know, this is not an example of a good, complete game, but this is a great example of, like, hey... They had the one thing, right? Do that one thing that's fun, right? And get that thing worked out. Uh, you shouldn't release your game at that point like this game did. <laughs> but they found, right, the good, the fun thing. Swing it around on a web. And they, they made that part perfect. Uh, they got it just right. Uh, and that's like the, a perfect foundation, right? Your proof of concept, your prototype for saying, yes, there is a fun game here that involves swing it on the web we've we've perfected the swing it on the web you know then you need to just build more game around it than what is available here so what was the point of this whole hour i love to use this slide i think i've used this in at least 20 or 30 panels over the years <laughs> i even had to make a widescreen version of it but uh we went in a lot of directions we played a bunch of atari games part of this was scott just making fun of me for failing at certain atari games but uh number one Designed simply, like a lot of these Atari games, a lot of early games 
are designed on paper first. If you can't fit the at the core of what you want your game to be on a few pieces of paper, you're probably starting too complex. You're starting at too high a level. You're starting too big. Your core's got to fit on a piece of paper or you're probably about to make a big mistake. Right. Well, also, you know, if you're just programming, even on a modern system where you can develop things more rapidly than you could in the, the past, right? It still takes a long time. You know, if you're doing something on paper, you can make it, test it, you know, sort of try it out a little bit, you know, to some extent quickly and figure out if it's good or bad, you know, without having to wait, you know, spend a few days programming and then you find out it was a bad idea. Right? Yeah. If you, uh, on paper, if you lay out your core mechanics and realize that they don't line up that well, you'll save yourself three or four years of building a prototype that then fails when you show it off at an indie showcase somewhere. Mm. And again, those constraints, it forces you to really, really just understand and internalize what is my game about. Really focus on that core essence of your game. What's going on here in this uh, diagram? Here? Uh, well, might be making acid, what, some what delicious poison. That? <laughs> it's some delicious some poison. delicious essence of poison. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is a stock image I purposed of distillation. All right, well, uh, you know. But think about any large, successful, popular game or any game you like. Can you describe what this game is about in no more than one sentence with no more than one complex piece of punctuation like a semicolon? And if you're going to make your first game, don't immediately, like, like there are times and places to use real big tools, just write code, like become a computer scientist. But there are a lot of tools out there you can use to make games that will serve these purposes. If you're making your first game, if you're making a simple game, if you're trying to try this space out, use whatever tool is easiest for you to use. If you're a programmer, Unity might be the easiest tool. If you're not a programmer or you're a dilettante programmer, Game Maker, uh, literally the Nintendo Switch Game Builder Garage that just came out, like use something simple, Twine. It literally doesn't matter. If your idea is good, and you use a very simple tool, even a tool that is arguably more of a toy than a tool, you'll be a that mechanic, that thing that's fun will shine through. Mm -hmm. And if you discover, you know, the, with the simple thing that you whipped up very quickly, right, is actually fun. Well, now you know that it's worth spending the time to go work on it fully, you know, uh, and make a real thing and not just a little sample thing. Yeah. And that's really the, the, the core of this panel, distilling this panel down to its essence. A lot of you probably want to make games. Uh, <laughs> that's just, that's how games are. People play games. They like games. They got opinions about games. And then they want to make games. If you want to make games and you're not sure where to start, just make one fun thing. However you do it, just make one. Make one thing and make it fun. If you can do that, you've taken the first step. It doesn't even have to be a new fun thing. It could be an existing fun thing, like jumping on people, right? Yeah. You know, or, <laughs> you know, just do a fun thing that games already do that's already fun and just make that. You don't have to make something, you know, that's never been done before. You look at most of the games that come out and make most of the money are not new. <laughs> They're just old ideas made again. Yep. Make one fun thing and make that one thing fun. I... Hope this was enjoyable. Uh, that QR code, I uh, hope it's been a while since I've used this slide. We'll take you to our website or our YouTube channel or something. But uh, that'll take you somewhere. If you enjoyed this, I highly recommend you check us out. We've got like 50 of our previous PAX talks and other gaming convention talks on YouTube free. Uh, we've been doing a podcast for like 15 years. There's about 1,500 episodes. If for some reason you like hearing us talk, that's a thing that you can do for many, 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 many hours, they're just MP3s of us talking on the internet that are freely downloadable with no <laughs> ads, no nonsense. You can just listen to our voice in your ear to your heart's content. I recommend doing that for zero minutes, but you can do it for the number of minutes of your choosing. I can't <laughs> stop you. So enjoy the rest of PAX Online or PAX East Online or Camp PAX, and uh, we'll see you in the Discord.